Good evening, everyone, um, or good afternoon still. Thank you for joining us today. We are going to be joined by, we are joined by Ruth Morgan this evening, and we will get started in just a few moments, and we'll just let everyone join in onto the session. Hi there, thank you so much, Cindy. I will share my screen now. I hope everybody can see this and hear me. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. Um, well, right. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and I'm really excited to be here um, and be speaking to you guys today. And as Cindy said, if you have any questions as we're going through, feel free to put them in the chat. It doesn't have to be specifically about what I'm going to talk about, but it could be about just um, getting into veterinary science or animal science um, or working with animals in science um, in the future. So as I say, I'm um, I'm Ruth Morgan, and I am what we call a reader. So that's um, just below professor um, in animal and veterinary sciences at the SRUC, which is um, a higher education um, and research institute here in Edinburgh. Um, and we specialise in animal veterinary sciences and um, agriculture, um, but also had courses in um, horticulture, applied animal sciences, animal welfare and behaviour. Um, so quite a range of topics, but all generally um, around um, around animals and, and the natural economy. So a bit about me. Um, I don't know if I should have so much Welsh paraphernalia on this after if anybody follows the rugby. We had a rather bad weekend this weekend, but I'm from Wales, originally from South Wales. Um, from a small village um, and uh, and in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I grew up there and that's probably what shaped um, a bit of my future and my interest um, in, in certainly in animals and in, um, in science a little bit. Um, but really my, my inspiration, uh, this is me with my grandfather um, and he was my inspiration. He was a farmer and he had these beautiful beef cattle that we're, that we're standing happily next to here. Um, and really what my interest was, I never thought I was interested in science, but I knew I was interested in animals and the way animals worked and uh, and the way animals interacted with each other and with people um, and how we made our food um, and, and everything about animals fascinated me. Um, and that's really... And, in my head, and I'd be interested to know what you guys think, but in my head, that wasn't really science. That was different. So I never really saw myself as a scientist. I, I saw science as being very much chemistry or physics or very strict biology. And, and my interest was in the whole animal. Um, so, so that was my, my inspiration, really, for, for wanting to be a vet. Um, and these were my various other inspirations. And I did a, a straw poll of some of my friends who were vets um, and asked them what their childhood inspirations were, and they just listed animals they'd owned um, or, or interacted with. So it's it's maybe something that most people grow out of, but I didn't. I wanted to be a vet from a very young age um, because of this this fascination with animals. And actually what it developed into was a real fascination with science and the way the body works, whether that body belongs to a horse, a dog, a cat, um, a, um, a sheep or a human, it's the way physiology works and the way our bodies keep going and the absolutely phenomenal way that um, that every cell interacts and every organ interacts. So that's what it developed into. But when I was this um, kid with bad hair, um, I was just just loved animals and and wanted to know how they work. So um, it's probably a bit of a cheesy a cheesy beginning. Um, so I went to vet school at the time, um, and I'm, I'm old now, I can tell you more about how to get into vet school these days, but back in the day, there were only six vet schools, um, and you had to apply to them all and go through an interview process. Um, and, and I got into Cambridge, and that was the only one I got into, so um, that's where I went, and that was quite common at the time, that you just got into one vet school and you didn't have to make any choices. Um, and... Cambridge was quite intimidating for me. I I didn't come from a background where uh, my parents hadn't been to university. Um, I hadn't come from a background really that was, um, you know, an automatic to to any of the 
um, the bigger universities. Um, and I really saw myself going somewhere more like Liverpool or Bristol, um, uh, these cool cities, which I really wanted to explore, but they didn't let me in. So I ended up in Cambridge um, and had the most wonderful six years. Um, it's it's an interesting place. It's um, full of very interesting people. Um, it's uh, it's unique in its own way. It has some ridiculous traditions that you either learn to embrace or you just think of slightly strange the whole way through. Um, but what it really gave me is is my friendship group. And, and I think wherever you go to university, that that's the big thing that comes out of it. Um, it was a challenge in terms of that leap that um, going from sixth form college to a university degree, particularly a veterinary degree, um, you were doing basically a whole A-level three times over in a term. And, and that was really a big challenge for me, taking on that workload. Um, and it, even though I'd got into vet school and, and I'd passed exams, it was a whole leap up. And I see that with the students I teach now. You go from being quite a high achiever at school, maybe, to being middling, to average, to not sure if you're going to pass. And that can be quite an emotional um, journey um, to kind of work out what, where you are. And I was also shocked at the amount of science um, in veterinary medicine. I had this idealistic view of um, just spending a lot of time with animals and making them better. And, and I was naive. Um, so the first lectures in pharmacology um, and biochemistry um, really uh, shocked me and uh, scared me initially. And I thought, I don't know if this is for me. Um, but what really inspired me as I went through vet school were the lecturers who put those into context. So why do we need to know about the pharmacology, the way drugs work? Well, if I want to give a drug to a horse, I need to know how it works and I need to know when not to give it um, and when to give it um, and when to give it and what interactions might happen. And so taking that science that I found quite daunting and, and putting it into really applied situations really helped me. Um, and I still didn't identify as a scientist um, all the way through vet school. I identified, I guess, as a vet student and and we mixed science in the sense that one minute you're in a lecture on biochemistry and you're studying the the detailed interactions of enzymes and substrates and things or doing pharmacokinetics and then the next minute you're um learning how to handle sheep and tip them over for shearing so it's quite a it's a degree of of many facets which um is brilliant and fantastic um, but does make you switch your brain quite a lot um, and and make you think. And always really, I suppose, those times when we're handling sheep or learning how to examine a dog and things, you're, you're trying to put that science into a context. So for me, science has always been quite contextual. So I love Cambridge. This is me ruining the graduation procession photo by fiddling with my hair um, and uh, we had a brilliant year um, year group um, and it was a really wonderful time so um, I spent six years there which is um, a year longer than most of the vet schools and now there are graduate entry programs where you can do vet school in four years um, but that meant that in our third year um, we got to um, take a year out, as it were, and do something different. Lots of people do zoology or um, uh, uh, or another sort of or pharmacology. Um, but given that I still wasn't identifying as a scientist, I did social sciences, I did sociology um, and criminology, and I had the best year. It was fantastic. Um, I learned so much, which I've then gone on to apply in my vet degree, actually, about psychology and the way people interact and and I just learned a lot from the from the sociology students I was studying with um, and uh, I, I loved it it was fantastic so then you go back into um, into veterinary medicine in fourth fifth and sixth year and in sixth year you're entirely in rotations so that means you're in small groups um, and you do clinical um, rotations through the hospital. So this is a picture at the bottom here is the small animal hospital in Cambridge, which is very dated now. Um, but um, uh, it, that's where you spend a lot of your time. So you're actually seeing animals, um, treating them and learning on the job, as it were. 
And since I've been at university, vet schools have changed so that you do a lot more practical things early on. Um, and again, as I was saying, it makes it easier to apply that science that you're learning. And a lot of it now is about problem-based learning, um, which, is, which is great. So the best, oh, before I show you that, I should give you a warning. I forgot to this at the beginning. There might be some slightly gruesome pictures in here of animals with various diseases or conditions. I apologize if anybody feels a little bit squeamish. Um, so given that, if you do look away for this slide, because there are a couple of squeamish ones. Um, so the best thing about vet school for me were my friends. Um, and I will talk about um, these particularly fantastic uh, women that I met there and I'm still close with. Um, all those years ago and I would whatever degree you do or whatever further or higher education you go on to um, the people you surround yourself really make the experience and the second best thing about vet school was traveling that I did and um, traveling all over the world as much as I could um, taking advantage of travel grants that were available to vet students but also to all students and within the university and various societies that I was a member of um, so in my first year, I went to South Africa and um, uh, and I said I was doing a research project. I'm not sure really it was a research project. Now I look back on it. It was more I was kind of following elephants around and it was fantastic and collecting some poo. Um, so that was brilliant. And then um, some of my third year, I went to Ghana um, and was um, sampling chickens um, for a, a study um, of a particular chicken virus, um, which was also brilliant. I got to meet some amazing vets um, at, uh, at the Centre for um, Tropical Diseases in Ghana and travel around Ghana. Um, and then for my final year rotation, um, I was like, right, I'm going back to, back to Africa. And I went to the Donkey Sanctuary Centre in Ethiopia and I did a project on lameness in donkeys. Um, there are 5 million donkeys in Ethiopia, um, uh, which is one of the biggest donkey populations in the world. Um, and they are really critical um, for, um, for society to function and particularly for women um, because they really have contributed to the emancipation of women in Ethiopia. So the donkeys can do the work so the women don't have to. That's, that's how it is. The donkeys can carry the water and things. And I was um, working with donkey sanctuary vets and looking at lameness. So this is a picture of at the top here of a donkey with a hyena bite. That was really, really common. And then on the bottom here, sadly, what the donkeys do is they, that's a donkey foot that has been run over by a car. Sadly, what they do is because it's hot and dusty and there's lots of flies, they like to lie on the side of the road and uh, with their feet into the road and because the cars go past and it wafts the flies away from them. But they often get run over. So um, I was documenting this to try and get a, a prevalence of each of the diseases, um, which I then went back and presented um, to uh, the International Forum for, for Working Equids, um, which was fantastic. And it's an interest I've, I've held going through in my, in my life. So I'd urge you to take any advantage you can to see the world when you're a student because there are much, a huge number of advantages that we don't necessarily tap into. Um, and research for me was at the time a way to travel. I was like, well, if I'm going to go here, I need to have a project. Let's think of something. And the, the two went hand in hand. So gradually I was getting a feeling that I quite liked investigating diseases and working out what was going on. Um, but really, I still thought I'm still a vet. I'm not a scientist. So I went into practice um, down in Dorset at the Barn Equine Surgery. Um, and I got my first dog, which is a, um, a big milestone for most vets when they, when they go into practice. You get your first puppy. This is Mabel. Um, and I worked as a, as a horse vet. Um, and then I went to Red Wings Horse Sanctuary. Um, uh, this is a picture of a, one of the poor horses we rescued there. And I was one of the hospital vets there. So that was basically being a vet in practice. So that's, um, we had at Red Wings, we had a thousand horses we look after. Um, uh, they're in Norfolk and um, they rescue horses from all over the country. Um, and it, it gives us, a, it gave me a huge amount of experience, um, both at the barn and at Red Wings, of being a, an, a, an in practice vet. So I was out on the road every day at the barn, um, seeing horses, meeting owners creeping through fields in the middle of the night, doing a lot of on-call, um, and, and I loved it. But I 
felt then almost immediately that I was itching for something more, that I recognized in myself that I needed to focus my attention and that I didn't want to be a jack of all trades. I wanted to be um, a master of one. Um, so I really wanted to focus on what I was doing. And also, I still had this hankering from the vet school research that I'd done to do some research. So um, after being at Red Wings for a while, I went to Liverpool. Sorry, gruesome picture again. Um, I'm not very good at these warnings. I apologize. Um, I went to Liverpool Vet School um, and there I did um, a, what we call a residency. So I've just put here, I can answer more questions about this. I won't, I won't tell you in detail, but as a vet, <laughs> when you qualify, you're qualified to treat all animals um, and then you can choose to specialise if you want. So I initially, when I graduated, I thought I'm only going to treat horses. I'm not going to treat dogs and cats and farm animals. Some of my friends did. They went and treated all animals. Some of them went to just do farm animals. Some went to just do dogs and cats and rabbits and things. Um, and others went for more exciting careers, which I can talk about a bit later. But I decided I wanted to do horses. And then within that, I wanted to specialize in medicine. So that means things that um, anything where it doesn't involve surgery, which is the middle picture. This is a horse with a, um, a, a twisted gut. Um, and these surgeons, actually one of them is me, um, is is untwisting it and, and going to help that horse. So I wanted to specialise in medicine, which is anything that's not cutting them open. So things like lung disease and heart disease and endocrinology, um, which is hormones um, and um, and foal medicine. Um, so that's why I went to Liverpool to, to specialise in. And that's when you see mainly medicine cases under the supervision of highly qualified vets and you also then take exams, diploma exams, um, and you also have to do some research. And as again, this part of my life was full of fantastic people, friends who are still friends now um, and was a brilliant time. This is us draining the chest of a horse so it has fluid around its lungs and we have put a tube in. As I said, this is a horse with what we call colic, so a twisted gut. And this is one of my successful foals over here that we we brought back from from the brink, and um, and it was a really special time at Liverpool. And I became what we call a diplomat in equine internal medicine and a European specialist in equine medicine, um, which sounds quite grand, but it, it's not really. It just means that you are a specialist. So in human medicine, that's really really common. Um, everybody becomes a specialist in whatever they are, even if it's GP. That is a specialism as well. But in vets, it's more frequent that people stay as general practitioners um, and fewer people specialise, I guess, because there are fewer animals and less money for people to spend on their animals. So I then was seeing referral cases. So the horses that had been seen by one vet and they decided that they needed a, an expert opinion, a specialist opinion, and they'd sent them to me. Um, and that's what I was doing. Um, and at the time I, I got into research again, um, so I I tinkered with it at Red Wing. This is a fat Shetland pony with um, a heart monitor on, an ECG. Um, and I just thought we don't know enough about hearts in in fat Shetland ponies. So I should um, I should do that. So I tinkered a little bit with research um, at Red Wings, and then I really got back into it when I was at Liverpool because it was part of my training. And this um, really sums up what my research is focused on. This is a large bottom of a very fat horse. Um, and obesity really became my focus of what I was interested in. So now we have a poll for you and I can maybe answer, see some stuff in the chat. I can maybe answer some questions. So while you're having a think about this, what percentages of horses and ponies in the UK do you think are overweight or obese? So get voting now and I'll just have a quick look at the chat. So the chat box, we've just got, we had a bit of a tech issue. But oh, the brand's changed now. Oh, no, that's, I, um, hopefully that's sorted with bed. But if anyone does have any questions in the meantime, if you'd like to put them into the chat box um, or by all means leave them to the end, but open to it. We're getting some really good feedback here. So we've got everyone that's responded. So I'm going to share the poll. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Great. So we've got 21% um, of you said 20%, 71% of you said 30%, and 7% said 40%. So the majority is correct. 
um, it is around 30%. In Scotland, it's more like 40%, but that's probably just based on the data we have. Um, but it is 30% of horses. Um, that's a lot in the UK that's overweight. Yeah, it's a lot. So it's overweight or obese. Obese is probably more like when 15 to 20%, um, but it's a lot of horses. Um, and we're not talking about your race horses that you might see on the telly. They're not generally over uh, uh, obese. We're talking much more about um, the ponies that you see in the fields and the horses that are just used for, for light exercise and, or as pets, definitely. We have a good question for you, um, Ibs, about, it's from Scarlett. Thank you, Scarlett. So she asked, hi, what was your favorite research project you did? Uh, in vet school, um, in vet school, it was definitely going to Ethiopia, um, I think because of the experience in Ethiopia. Um, since then, it's probably been my research um, that I've done on equine obesity, which I'm going to talk about now. So um, maybe I'll come back to that question at the end and see which one of my projects I've loved the most. Um, and I feel like they've all developed um, as I've gone on. And um mm -hmm coming from just a curious mind. I'm just interested to know why. I'm, a, I'm like an annoying child. I just say why. Um, so yeah, that's that's probably where it's come from. But at vet school, it was definitely going to Ethiopia. Um, and that was the first project I kind of designed by myself. I mean, it was terrible when I look back at it, but I I really loved it. And, and I felt like it was making a difference. And those projects for me are the most important where you feel like you can somehow help the animals or the owners. Um, and at the moment, I, yeah, th those are the projects I love the most. Shall I, shall I carry on? Yeah, great. Very good answers and questions. <laughs> so, um, oh, so I've got another question for you then. Um, we'll just open this for a little bit. But why is being fat a problem for a horse? Um, so yeah, it's a question for you. Uh, no, there's no such thing as a wrong answer. Um, I, I'm going to give you the main reason in a second, but does anybody have any idea, um, why being fat might be a, a problem for a horse? Um, you can put your responses just in the chat box and I'll read them out. So why is being fat a problem for a horse? You put your responses just in the chat box. I'll read them out. It would stress on the legs can lead to back problems. Yeah, okay, great. Predisposing them to other conditions such as arthritis. Brilliant. Let's give you a minute, That's another minute. Those are really good ones and they've all, oh, sorry. Um, they've all drawn on, on, the fact that um, that being a fat horse is is similar to being overweight as a human and that it's putting strain on the joints, um, definitely. Um, and um, I think that's really important. But what it specifically does, oh, there's one more, damaged legs from standing lot. Okay, Jess is getting really, really close to what I'm going to talk about. Um, and I, I wonder... Um, I wonder if she's she's got it. But what, I, what I'm going to talk about is one particular condition they get, which is called laminitis. So laminitis is a disease of the hooves of the horse. Um, and it's definitely a good guess to say that it might be because the horse is getting fatter and fatter and they're put, putting more weight on the feet. And that definitely is a... Um, is a, um, a re one of the contributing factors. But actually... Um, the reason they get laminitis is because of the hormones that are affected by being obese. So I'm just going to show you a video. Let me read you. Mute it. This is a video of a horse with quite severe laminitis. And even if you're not familiar with horses, I think you could probably see that she's not that comfortable walking or he's not that comfortable walking and is walking very gingerly as if... You know, you might have done a big run the day before and then and then you're feeling really sore and not wanting to to move very well. And then this one down here, which I need to get rid of the screen to my help. Uh, is a little Shetland pony. 
um, who has recovered from laminitis but still has quite sore feet. And you can see the way this pony is walking very out to the side, a very strange little pottery gate. Um, and it's a real welfare issue. About 25% of the horses who get laminitis never recover and have to be euthanized. Um, and it's only recently that we've really seen how much um, it's associated with being fat. Um, and we did used to think that, yes, it's because the horses get get really fat and, and therefore their their hooves start to disintegrate. But actually, the more work we do, the more we know that it's because of the endocrinological hormone changes that happen when the horse gets fat. So this is a um, another gruesome picture. Um, I'm going to try and get rid of this. Um, so this is the normal horse's hoop. So it's we horses stand on their on their um the top of their finger. They have one bone that they stand on, so they've got one finger basically. Um, and it's suspended in this amazing hoof capsule, which um uh which is unique in nature. It's this interdigitating structure which is super strong when it works, but like a lot of things with the horse. As it starts, to, when it fails, it really fails badly. Um, so you can see in this normal foot, this bone is held nice and parallel to the hoof here. But then as the, as the tissue fails that's holding it there, it starts to rotate. And eventually you get this horrible situation at the bottom where the bone comes through the bottom of the foot. Um, and horses really can't walk when it's like that. So it's really horrible for them. It's very, very painful. And it's a big, big welfare issue. Um, and we'll come back to later how obesity leads to laminitis. But I'm just going to talk to you more a little bit about, about obesity itself in horses. So why do horses become obese? Well, they eat too much and they don't exercise enough. This is correct. Um, just like humans, um, if they eat too much grass but aren't desert orchid here doing big long races, um, then they will become fat because most of our horses also get fed supplementary food and they spend most of their days like this, um, ha having a snooze and not doing any exercise. So as I said earlier, when we're talking about obesity, we're not talking about these beautiful fancy racehorses here. We're talking about these chubby chubby little ponies, you get fed too much and don't exercise enough. But it's not that simple. Just like in humans, it's not that simple. We now know that obesity is a disease. It's not just because you're eating too much and not exercising enough. There are so many other factors um, and factors that we've learned from humans that we can take into horses and some of my work that I've learned in horses that we can take into humans. And it's really about your genes. So in horses, we see different types of risk. And it's all to do with the genes that make up the horse. So we see a breed risk. So for those who don't know much about horses, um, we have um, what we call native breeds. So they are ponies that are native to the UK. So that would be a Shetland pony or an Exmoor or a Dartmoor or a Welsh cob. Um, and they are particularly susceptible to becoming obese compared to the thoroughbred that originated um, in the Arab states. So they're used to the desert environment, whereas our ponies um, are meant to have a change in climate. But actually what we've done is fertilize all the grass um, and they now get really, really fat. So there's a breed risk. We, say, we look at the horse, what breed is it? Is it likely to get fat? And then there's an individual risk. So this is a herd of Exmoor ponies who are all more at risk than a thoroughbred, say. But within this group, there will be ones that are more at risk than others. And that's due usually to single um, nucleotide mutations or, or SNPs, um, single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, um, which make the individual more susceptible. And then we know very little in, in horses, but there's a familial risk. So if the mother um, is overweight when she's carrying the foal, um, then um, the foal is more likely to become fat when they get older, just like in humans. But that's very complicated. We don't know enough in horses. And what we really don't know is what the genes are determining. So are they determining being fat or are they determining eating too much? Um, for example, being hungry all the time, or is it a less efficient metabolism of food? Um, or is it, I hate this bar, is it the consequences uh, of obesity? Um, and for all of those, we don't know yet in the horse is the, is the answer. But we do know some exciting things in dogs. 
um, which um, means that we have now identified the genes in Labradors um, which make them more likely to be overweight. And those genes are associated with the brain and how hungry they feel. So if you've ever encountered a Labrador dog, um, you know, they've probably been a bit chubby um, and they've probably tried to beg you for a, for a snack. Um, and that's a genetic mutation that we've bred into Labradors um, and it makes them more likely to become obese. Um, and that's similar to humans who um, become overweight or obese. They also often have a genetic mutation which makes them more hungry. Um, so it's some fascinating research there. Um, and we bred that into Labradors because if the Labrador is hungry, it's more likely to be well-trained because you can train a dog that wants food to do things. Um, and so there's a particularly high uh, rate of this mutation um, in guide dogs where they've been selected um, to be really well behaved, which is quite interesting. We're not there with horses yet, but I'm doing some work. So let's just have a quick look at adipose tissue and fat. Um, we won't go into it too much, but fat used to be thought of as just this big bag where we put all our fat um, and it does nothing and it sits there. And, and when we need the fat, we take it out. But now we know that it's a huge microcosm of endocrinology. So there is so much going on in every cell that we call an adipocyte. Um, and there's immune cells and there's blood vessels and it's dynamic and it's changing. And depending where the fat is, it's either safe fat or unsafe fat. Um, and there's so much we now know. And in humans, when you get ha have a healthy um, weight gain, so if you needed to put some fat on, because fat is essential for life, don't forget that. Fat is really, really important, and we all need it. Um, people who have a genetic mutation and can't put down fat, um, uh, they... Um, they can't, they're very unhealthy and they can't regulate their, their insulin. So we need fat. So fat's good. And when we put it down normally, we get lots more fat cells and that's called hyperplasia. But when people um, eat too much or have too much of a calorie intake, then instead of getting more cells, we just get bigger cells. And what we did is look in horses and we found the same thing in horses. So this is a lean horse and you can see lots of little adipocytes, as we call them, fat cells. And this is an obese horse. And this is where I had to double check my scale a lot, lots of times to make sure I wasn't seeing things because these adipocytes are absolutely huge. And that means that they become unhealthy because they're too stretched. They're too far away from their blood supply. They become inflamed and resistant to the effects of insulin. So that's unhealthy adipose tissue. So we showed that, that we took from humans what happens and we said, does this happen in horses? And yes, it does. So why is obesity bad for horses? It's due to the fat and it's due to the hormones. But does anybody know which hormones obesity affects most strongly? Now I will look at the chat box here. This is an open-ended question for our chat box if you want to um, put in your guesses. So obviously there's some ideas here of where you find them. So does anyone know which hormones are specifically for obesity or affects obesity? Any ideas? Well, I'm thinking about that, and Bev did, put a really good point in that um, being fat adds pressure to all the systems with organs being strangulated by the fat. Um, so I wonder if you've got experience of lipomas, which is what horses get, where a big fat ball in their, um, in their abdomen swings around some of the gut, and that actually physically traps the gut, and that, that can be quite serious in horses. Um, so you might have well, like a problem that. Is very painful. They need surgery to, to resect it. So, yeah, it's very important. So just to prompt you then, we've got all of the, um, the uh, endocrine glands here um, that produce um, all of our hormones that are really important. Um, and I've put adipose tissue because it is the most important endocrine gland, but it never get features in any of these pictures. Um, so we've got the sex um, glands here, ovaries and the testes, and then we've got the pancreas and the adrenals um, and the thyroid gland, which does your metabolic rate, your parathyroid gland, which sorts out your calcium and your pituitary gland, which governs everything. It's the master gland. And that's so, the sex, I guess, parathyroid hormone. Is that what? So it's not. It's a good guess because um, it's associated with the thyroid, which is metabolism, um, but it's not that affected by obesity. It generally impacts calcium parathyroid, 
Um, but I can see where you've come from because thyroid disease can cause obesity, certainly in dogs and in humans. If you have an underactive thyroid, that can cause obesity. But we're looking at this the other way. If you become obese, what might be affected? Ah, here we go. Scarlett and Sophia. Adrenal gland, yes, that's activated and that produces cortisol. And Sophia's got insulin. So we've got them. We Finance. Cortisol and insulin are the big ones which are affected by obesity. So that's really good, guys. Um, and um, yeah, and the thyroid gland is also associated with obesity. So you're you're all right. Um, so the pancreas makes your insulin, the adrenal glands make your cortisol, um, and those those are what are mainly affected in obesity. So just a little bit about insulin. Insulin controls your blood sugar. When you eat food, um, you get lots of sugar absorbed into the blood from the gut and you get an increase in your insulin. And what the insulin does is it tells mainly your muscle, there's lots of glucose around, can you take it up, please? Um, and it acts amazingly because it sends transporters from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell to open up little pores to allow glucose to come through. Um, and that's really cool. Um, so all the glucose is taken up into the tissue so that they can be used, so it can be used. And the blood sugar falls back to normal levels and the insulin reduces. So insulin increases, you take up all the sugar, insulin decreases. But insulin also affects blood vessels and adipose tissue. So it has one, like everything in the body, like all hormones, you think it has one effect and then it has loads more effects. And when it becomes dysregulated, that's when the effects on other tissues really matter. And cortisol is about coping with stress. So cortisol is your main stress hormone. It's brilliant. It's the hormone you really, really need, even though you don't want stress. You do need cortisol to cope with the stress. So this is a wild horse, say, a Pawlowski horse um, going about its business, and it encounters a bear. Probably not this bear because this bear looks like it's in captivity, but use your imagination. If it counts as a bear, that's a stressful event. Initially, what happens is it gets a big adrenaline rush, um, which increases its heart rate and allows it to run. But the bear can run too. So both of them have to have energy to run. And what cortisol does is it, it mobilizes all that glucose from everywhere in the body and says, we need it for our muscles and our brain so we can keep going and we can make good decisions. And that's basically what cortisol does. Um, and in the wild, that's really, really essential because if you start running from the bear, you need to keep running and then you need to find food and you need to make sensible decisions about where you're going to go. So cortisol is really key for that. But our horses, really domesticated horses, live a, a spoilt life and don't really suffer from a huge number of stresses, certainly no bears. Um, my horse particularly hated pigs, and it's renowned now that horses don't like pigs. So this might be a stress they encounter, but they're not going to have to run any distance um, to escape from them. Um, they might just ditch their rider and, and run off. Um, one stress that our animals might encounter is nutritional stress. So that could be not having enough food or more likely having too much food. So anything which impacts the blood glucose will impact cortisol and insulin, and too much is always is a bad thing. So cortisol coordinates the short and long-term stress response, and nutritional stress is a stress. And it affects how nutrients are used and also how fat is deposited. So it makes sense um, that it, um, it will be affected by obesity. It also counters the effect of insulin. So I remember I was saying insulin makes the glucose go into the cell, well cortisol brings it out so it can, um, it can uh, be used for energy. And this is what I study. Um, I study how cortisol is impacted. And it's all about balance. So in obesity, you get an increase in insulin, increase in cortisol, and this adipose, um, this fat tissue um, uh, hypertrophy, unhealthiness. So how might these changes in hormones affect the feet and cause laminitis? Um, we've said all these changes occur, and some of that has been my research work, um, and I've touched on it a little bit. Um, but how does then that affect the feet? It, just, it doesn't really make any sense. Well, this is a beautiful picture of the blood supply of the foot of a horse, and you can see how amazing and intricate it is. So the foot needs loads and loads of blood. Um, and remember what I said, that insulin and cortisol both affect the blood vessels. So if you have too much of insulin or too much cortisol, the blood vessels can't dilate as well or they constrict more. And what you see in laminitis 
and you can see from these pictures, so this one down here, this bottom A, shows the big vessels in what we call a venogram. So we've injected dye into the horse's foot so we can see its vessels. And it's got big vessels. But in this one on the panel on the right, this is a horse with laminitis. And these vessels have just disintegrated. There's no blood vessels. And that's because of the hormone imbalances. It's a little bit like diabetes in humans where you get diabetic foot disease, except that's more to do with glucose, but it's a similar sort of effect. And this is what I work on. So how does the obese horse become the laminitic horse? And so this is just um, some of my work, actually, this graph where I've shown. So this at the top here is a, is a normal blood vessel. Um, uh, this The filled in bars showing the big reduction is a normal blood vessel relaxing in response to what we call acetylcholine. So it's just something that makes the blood vessel relax. And the top bar, which isn't relaxing as much at all, um, is a laminitic horse. So a horse with laminitis and obesity that has too much insulin, too much cortisol, its blood vessel can't relax as much at all. So then the blood vessels are affected to the feet. And because of the bad design of the horse, um, once the blood vessels start getting affected, the tissue in the foot will start to die. And that's why that bone can't be sustained. So it's a really interesting to go from fat tissue to feet, um, but but that's that's where my work kind of goes. So the obesity and the insulin imbalances stop the horse's blood vessels relaxing, um, and it's not only the blood vessels that the feet are affected. So it's blood vessels all over, and they get a condition what we call equine metabolic syndrome, and that is um, a syndrome very similar to human equine metabolic syndrome. So human metabolic syndrome is defined as a collection of risk factors, which may, including genetics, obesity and insulin resistance, which makes a person more likely to have cardiovascular disease or a stroke or diabetes. And we use exactly the same definition in horses, which is um, equine metabolic syndrome includes genetics, as I've talked about with the breeds, um, uh, obesity, um, as I talked about, and insulin resistance, um, which makes them more likely to have laminitis. So it's the exact equivalent. So what do I do now? I talked a bit about what I do, but I thought I'd talk you through kind of my week, um, which is is never uh, never um, a dull moment. Um, so I run an endocrine clinic. This is one of my patients. This is Laddie. Um, and I run a, a clinic for horses and ponies with obesity and other hormonal disorders, um, so uh, Cushing's disease as well. Um, and I really, I say I run the clinic for the horses, but really I run it for the owners to help them with diet and weight loss. Um, and we test all their hormones. And the reason Laddie is is fighting with this hay net is because this is a really good way to lengthen the time that it takes for a horse to eat a hay net. If you hang it in the middle of a stable, then they can't pin it against the wall and just gobble it. They have to really work for their food. And that's about balancing dieting a horse with its welfare because horses need to forage all the time. And so a lot of my time is spent making sure that even though that horse is on a diet, it's still stimulated and because eating is such an important part um, uh, it's such an important thing for a horse. So I make sure that they're stimulated, that they're psychologically, they're well cared for. Um, and that's a really important part part of my job. Um, and Laddie is doing brilliantly now. He had fun, he had a horrible bout of laminitis and we've brought him back and he lost a hundred kilos and he's brilliant. Um, he still doesn't like the hay net being in the middle of the stable, I don't think, but um, he's doing really well. He looks adorable. <laughs> he is fabulous. Um, and then the other thing I do, so I run my clinic. And then the other thing I do is I run research projects on the relationship between stress hormones, so cortisol and obesity. And I do this in different species. And I do it in um, the lab, in samples and cells. And I also collect samples from horses. Um, and I work with animal models. So I also work with pigs. And then I also work with some translational work with humans. So I work across kind of all the spectra. Um, sometimes I'm in the lab. The top picture here um, is some pre-adipocytes, so um, before they become fat cells. And if we put a load of cortisol and insulin on them, this is what they become. And all these red blobs are the lipid droplets in them. So that's really cool. You can grow fat cells in the lab and then you can put things on them and see what happens or you can see what they're releasing. And you can do this from different animals to see what it is about a horse, horses or what it is about um pigs maybe, that, that makes their adipocytes different. Um, and I also 
take lots of measurements from clinical cases. And then I work with um, my colleagues who are medics um, who work with obese humans um, uh, on uh, on how stress hormones alter in obesity in humans as well. So we discovered a particular um, uh, product of cortisol metabolism, which is um, called 20 beta dihydrocortisol. You don't need to know the name, but um, and we discovered in horses it was really associated with uh, with obesity. And then um, I went with some colleagues and we looked back in human samples and found it was also a marker of human obesity. Um, and it implies that the adrenals are activated and that that, that obesity is basically a stress state. And then I also teach. I teach on the Applied Animal Sciences course um, and the Veterinary Sciences course and a Master's in Equine Science. And I teach the current residents in equine medicine and I do quite a lot of public engagement. So this was me um, teaching about the horse's heart using, this is an Exmoor pony in the background who was reluctantly running around with an ECG on. Um, we tried unsuccessfully to get him to canter. Um, he would only trot. Um, but yeah, so I teach um, a lot of different courses um, and uh, and I really enjoy that. And what inspires me now was well, still my friends. I wanted to just come back to this picture that I'd showed before because um, being a vet doesn't just mean treating animals necessarily. I do lots of different things. And I just thought this was a really nice example of the different um, things you could do as a vet. Um, because um, this is Kat and she lives in New Zealand and she is the soft tissue surgeon for small animals. So she does very fancy, fancy surgery uh, on dogs and cats um, in a referral hospital in New Zealand um, and uh, has a fantastic life. Um, and this is Helen and she is a dairy farm specialist um, in Dorset. So she um, lives on a farm, actually. She married a dairy farmer and she runs um, a, a consultancy firm, um, a veterinary consultancy, uh, and they advise dairy farms on health and well-being and, um, and milk production. Um, and then Lucy um, is an ophthalmologist, so she specialises in eyes. Um, uh, dogs and cats eyes um, and she also teaches at Nottingham University and Louisa is probably the coolest of us all because she lives in Ecuador and is a monkey vet um, and she also looks after Gloth and, um, and teaches and armadillos um, and a puma currently um, so she yeah she is a vet for all manner of, of um, animals so my friends and my colleagues inspire me now um, and um, my patients, um, and this is my PhD student, Lisa, with some of our piggies, and the animals and owners I work with, um, who still inspire me. So with that, I don't know if I've gone over or, or what, but I'll take any questions. Um, this is just a picture of my current dog, Dora, um, and I'd like to thank all my friends and collaborators, and, and I'm funded by the Wellcome Trust. Um, so I see there's some chat, but I don't know if that's just... Uh, Technical. Yeah, just some more technical issues, but now we've got a few moments, so give them plenty of time um, for any questions. Oh, that is such a cute dog. And thank you so much for the presentation. I've learned a lot. I didn't know there was so much involved. And oh my goodness, it looks like they're ballerinas standing on the tip of their toes. Yeah, it's a very sore tree. Yeah, that doesn't look very pleasant. So we've got one. How did your friend get to work in Ecuador? Yeah, you see, everybody wants to know about Louisa because she's got the cool job. Um, <laughs> so when we qualified, she um, spent some time as a small animal vet um, in the south of England, um, got her skills, got her surgery skills and her clinical exam skills. What being a vet gives you is this comparative um, outlook. So yes, we learn dogs, cats, horses, cows, sheep, but you learn to mix between the species and, and adapt. So um, uh, she did lots of small animal work, got really good at that, and then um, went to Ecuador and, um, and volunteered at this particular organization, actually. She, she said to me when she went, oh, I'm just going for a couple of months. I just need some time off. Um, and that was 10 years ago. Um, so um, she, they then employed her as, as their vet. Um, and yeah, she, that's, that's how, so she went out and did volunteer work. There's lots of volunteering opportunities to work with animals. Often they're not funded, unfortunately. So, um, it's good to look for opportunities like I did when I was at vet school for, for travel grants, um, or funding. Um, but her organization certainly takes volunteers in their gap years, um, 
And it's a lot of dealing with monkey poo. It's not very glamorous, um, but it is an amazing place. I've been to visit her and it's fantastic. That leads really well into the next question about for anyone wanting to get into veterinary from school, what pathway would you suggest to be the best to get into university? So how would you recommend they get there? So uh, this is a really, really good question. And it's changed, I would say, from what I do now um, interviewing vet students or prospective vet students. What we're looking for is different and we're looking for real people, not just people who've got their A-levels or all at A's or whatever. We're looking more for people who can communicate because being a vet is actually dealing with people. Um, and that's a shock to a lot of a lot of people when we get to vet school because you think it's dealing with animals. But the animals can't talk, so you're really dealing with the people. Um, so my suggestion would be get plenty of work experience if you can. Volunteer at a... It doesn't have to be Ecuador. It can be the local dog shelter or stables. Go and see some farms if you can. If that's if, even if you're not interested, to see if that's um, what you like. Um, get life experience. Um, it's great when we look at applicants who who have got a job in you know um, customer services because they know they'll have dealt with some difficult people and um, you'll be able to communicate really well. So having a really rounded um, uh, rounded kind of life is great and not a disadvantage. Um, so taking a gap year is, is brilliant as well. Um, the best pathway tends to be going from A-levels straight in, um, but I would advise taking a gap year because I think it makes you older and wiser and more like you're going to enjoy it. Yeah, and you can really decide if that's what you want to do. Also, our graduate programs are excellent. So we have, I teach on the Applied Animal Sciences course, so that's often students who haven't necessarily got the grades at A-level and they, they come and do an Applied Animal Sciences or a Veterinary Biosciences degree. Uh, decide if it's for you and then go on a graduate program to vet school, um, which is another really good path, actually. I think it's it used to be that you decide when you're five you want to be a vet and then you end up as a vet. But actually, I've become something very different. I've become a scientist and I look back and say, would I... Would I have been a vet? Well, vet's given me all these opportunities and I've loved it. But actually, maybe if I'd given myself a bit more time and a bit more experience, I would have realised I wanted to be a pure scientist or a doctor. Um, uh, so, yeah. Um, but your path changes and yeah, taken in any direction you want. Which um, And then Megan has asked as well, what the organisation is called in Ecuador. So they've applied Still not the it. cool one. It's called Merizonia. I can type it in here. Give them a follow on social media. They're fantastic. Um, they've, yeah, they've currently got some baby sloths who are just oh gorgeous. <laughs> baby sloths, how would Yeah, oh. fantastic. So, yes. So any other questions today? Some really good ones, eh? We good. I think I always wanted to be a vet when I was um, younger and then I got to college and I did a bit of suturing and somehow it never tied the knot and it was always loose. I was like, okay, next career path it is. <laughs> and I think yeah, I still can't way. suture though. That's why I chose medicine. So. <laughs> oh, I should have done that. <laughs> so I'll give a couple of minutes more for just a few more questions. Yeah, lovely. Um, I think Megan says she's already applied to vet school, so good luck. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope I hope you do well. Okay. Ooh, if someone apply, wanted to apply for a high up uni, what would they look for? So by high up uni, do you mean like uh, one of the really well, world renowned kind of things? So like Cambridge has high standards, don't they as well? It's, it's interesting for vets. It's quite a level playing field, actually. Yeah. So. Um, Cambridge, Vet Edinburgh School. Uni. Yeah, Edinburgh is fantastic. Edinburgh is the highest ranked, um, but all of the vet schools look for the same things and it's competitive to get into any of them. Um, so I've been now to Cambridge to my undergrad and then Liverpool for my postgraduate and then Edinburgh for my PhD um, and I teach at Edinburgh. So and they're all brilliant, actually. And I think... Um, 
do you know what? It really doesn't matter where you go in the end because it's about who you're with and you make a great, you make it great because it's a great experience. Um, and they're all, they all offer really, really good degrees. Um, so the high up unis look for exactly the same as all the others, really. And there are more universities um, offering VET now and they will be newer courses. They will be different courses, but there's a big drive to have more open access because they've realized that we need people who are really good at communicating and and that's more important than than being than getting an A in physics at A level. It's more important that you can talk to an owner who's really distressed about their animal um, than it is having a lot of compassion. Yeah, and having compassion and empathy. Um and but obviously they they put um they uh, there's a still a huge amount to learn, so that's why there is a high standard in terms of um, grades that you need to get. Okay. Brilliant. And then we've just got, do you have any book recommendations for people thinking of studying vet? So, Siona, is that is like in preparation, or do you mean whilst you're studying? Because that might be a bit different. Because the textbooks I've seen of vet looks really. Yeah, I wouldn't bother diving into a veterinary textbook. I would mm-hmm. say rather than book. I would um, start subscribing to Farmers Weekly um, and uh, the veterinary record, things like that. Um, they tell you what's really going on. Um, in And if you're going to an interview, then it's really great when you meet a student who can say, I'm really worried about TB and badgers in the UK, or I'm really worried about avian flu. Um, or, you know, I'm really worried about brachycephalic breeds. So that's dogs with squashed faces and all those issues. Um, I think it's really important to be aware of where vets sit and where vets sit in the One Health um, agenda now. Um, so I would, yeah, get into Farmers Weekly, follow them online. They're great. And um, Veterinary Record and the Vet Times, are they like the newspapers for vets? Um, I, yeah, that's what I do is is find out what's what's hot topics in veterinary medicine at the moment. Brilliant. And then Beth has a question about, do you know if universities would accept an HNC level four as a pathway into veterinary? So currently, I don't think there are any that accepts HNCs or HNDs, but the SIUC, which is an organization that I work for, we are creating a vet school um, and there will be an HNC, HND um, pathway. My advice for that actually would be to go into um, a related degree initially, if you can. So Applied Animal Sciences at SIUC, for example, it's fantastic. Um, uh, and there's a great animal physiology lecturer there. Um, uh, 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 that Or a biomedical science, um, sorry, biovet sciences at the Royal Vet College, things like that. Because going from an HNC straight into degree can be really challenging. And um, I think it, it's probably um, better for you to go via a, a different degree. I realise that that's quite a, a big undertaking financially and time-wise. Um, but it also gives you a really good grounding. And then the people who've done that just fly through their veterinary degree and can really focus on what they're interested in. Um, so... Yeah, we offer applied animal sciences um, and um, uh, obviously offer veterinary biosciences and a few other places. But look out for the new SIUC vet degree, which will be coming in the next couple of years. Um, University of Lancaster is offering new vet degrees, but I'm not sure about the HNC qualification. The only reason that A-levels are required or, or that they, they put that higher is because it's a big leap from school to degree level with vets because the sheer amount of of stuff you have to put into your brain um, is really hard. Um, so that's Definitely. the only way, that's the only reason they kind of distinguish that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but also to the universities, reach out to them and talk to admissions staff because they're much more open-minded than they ever used to be about different pathways into veterinary medicine, Definitely. That really gives a good encouragement then it's the the CR uh CR Um if they if you're developing one, then it gives a good encouragement to do that gap year. So that's yes. really good to know. Fantastic. And getting all that experience. Um so we've just overran a little bit, but uh, Sorry. really good questions now. Um and then there's just uh EMS abroad. 
EMS abroad. So that's extramural studies. So um, that's uh, somebody who's is in on the vets at the moment. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, do whatever gets you really good experience. So I suppose what I would caution against is only going to Ecuador and seeing monkeys. Because if you're going to vet school, you'll be up against people who have got a lot of grounding in dogs and cats and horses. And and if you've, yes, you spent six months with monkeys, that's not necessarily, that's be an amazing experience in and of itself, but not necessarily what they're looking for at vet school. If you're at vet school and doing EMS, um, then I would recommend going somewhere where they'll let you have lots of hands-on experience. Um, so the donkey sanctuary in Ethiopia is amazing um, and you'll learn loads um, and see things you'll never see again. I've never seen another hyena bite in the UK. Um, so places like that. And there are lots of charities and um, Spana and the other charity. Sorry, I mainly know horse charities, but um, and there's also dog and cat um, uh, spay clinics and castration clinics in Greece and Turkey. Um, and there are some rescue charities as well. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's so great and invaluable information for all of our students. And, oh, just been offered a place. Ah. Uh, um, so the Donkey Sanctuary is literally called The Donkey Sanctuary. Um, <laughs> that's easy to find. Yeah, so if you Google The Donkey Sanctuary, they have... Um, they have a clinic in Addis, oh no, in Deborah's Eight, which is just south of Addis Ababa. Thank you. Yeah, so that's great information. So does, if anyone has any more questions, please email engage at Welcome Connecting Science and we will relay them back to Ruth. Thank you everyone for joining us. And if I just share quickly the screen. So our next talk will be by Dr. Kagabo and that will be on the 9th of March. So just join us on bit.ly forward slash MSF dash nine mark. And you'll be able to find us there. But thank you so much, Ruth. This has been fantastic. So I'll give you a round of applause for everyone. And it's been invaluable information and so exciting hearing about your work. Great. It's been it's been really lovely. I've really enjoyed it. Um so yeah, I'm happy to take any questions um via your email. That's absolutely fine. Brilliant. Thank you. And hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. Take care. Bye. Bye.